tens of thousands of people in solitary confinement all around the world. There may even be a prison using it not far away from where you are right now. And the experiences of prisoners in solitary are completely changing how we think about the human mind. Part 1. All Alone For a long time, people in the Western philosophical tradition have said that human minds are separate, 100% discrete individuals, sealed off units. You can find ideas like this in thinkers like René Descartes or Zeri Jacob, even Aristotle, who said man is a political creature and one whose nature is to live with others, thought that human beings were separate from each other and the world. We enjoy socialising, need socialising maybe, but still, there's that gap. I'm not going to get too deep into this today, but that model of the individual self isolated from others, it's the theory of mind that capitalism assumes. And it was part of what inspired a lot of early proponents of solitary confinement. Take somebody who's done wrong, seal them away somewhere where they can reflect, have a chat with their ideal self, and hopefully come out better. It almost sounds humane. More humane, at least, than thumbscrews or burning them in public or executions. Surely. It's difficult to know exactly how many people are being held in solitary confinement today. In the United States, all the estimates I've seen are measured in tens of thousands, but disagreements about definitions, as well as changing definitions and policies and court decisions, reporting and recording errors and different counting procedures, have led to a lack of reliable and valid data on supermax issues. Also, sometimes people are subjected to what looks an awful lot like solitary confinement but isn't officially called that. They call it the secure housing unit or the control unit or preventative detention. In my country, the Department of Justice has said that we don't do solitary confinement. And yet a report in 2017 by Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Prisons said that not only are we doing it, we're even doing it to children. However many people are being held in solitary though, and whatever its legal definition, in her book, Solitary Confinement, philosophy professor Lisa Gunther argues that they almost invariably don't come out better. They are harmed by the experience, of course, as well as the general unpleasantness of being locked up. They can also hallucinate, become disoriented, distressed, depressed, anxious, psychotic, suicidal even. But even beyond that, human beings kept in solitary can actually lose their minds and their ability to interpret their own experiences. There are many ways to destroy a person, but one of the simplest and most devastating is through prolonged solitary confinement. Deprived of meaningful human interaction, otherwise healthy prisoners become unhinged. They see things that do not exist, and they fail to see things that do. Their sense of their own bodies, even the fundamental capacity to feel pain and distinguish their own pain from that of others, erodes to the point where they're no longer sure if they're being harmed or harming themselves. And Goethe says that's because we've been wrong about minds all this time. We're not actually discrete individuals, at least not as much as we thought. We're a network. We're not a hive mind, obviously, but if we were 100% separate, then we wouldn't expect solitary to completely destroy somebody's capacity for meaningful experience in quite the way that it can. She says in order to explain what it does to a human being, we're going to need an entirely new theory of mind. Part 2. Phenomenology Goethe begins with the testimony of survivors of solitary confinement. So, let's hear some. Now, be warned, they are a little bit disturbing, but have a listen and see what you can spot. Here are the words of Jack Henry Abbott, who was imprisoned in solitary confinement and complete darkness. I heard someone screaming far away. And it was me. I fell against the wall and, as if it were a catapult, was hurled across the cell to the opposite wall. Back and forth I reeled from the door to the walls, screaming insane. That was after only 23 days. Here's some more from prisoners in Walpole Prison in Massachusetts. The shortest term was 11 days, the longest 10 months. I seem to see movements, real fast motions in front of me. And then it seems like they're doing things behind your back. Can't quite see them. Does someone just hit me? I dwell on it for hours. Melting. Everything in the cell starts moving. Everything gets darker. You feel like you're losing your vision. I can't concentrate, can't read. 
Your mind's narcotized. Sometimes can't grasp words in my mind that I know. Get stuck, have to think of another word. Memory is going. You feel you are losing something you might not get back. And finally, the words of Robert King, a Black Panther who was imprisoned in a cell six foot by nine foot for a murder he didn't commit for 29 years and lived. When I walked out of Angola, I didn't realize how permanently the experience of solitary would mark me. Even now, my sight is impaired. I find it very difficult to judge long distances, a result of living in such a small space. Emotionally, too. I found it hard to move on. I talk about my 29 years in solitary as if it was the past, but the truth is, it never leaves you. In some ways, I'm still there. What is it about living in a static, unchanging world without other people that causes these kinds of experiences? And remember, these are just the people who got out and are able to talk about it. There'd be others who could tell us a lot more about solitary if only they were in a state to. But that I am forbid to tell the secrets of my prison house. I could a tale unfold whose lightest word would harrow up thy soul, freeze thy young blood. To account for these experiences, Goethe draws on a tradition in philosophy known as phenomenology. Now, a full survey of phenomenology is somewhat beyond today's scope, but in brief, it's the practice in philosophy of putting the quality of experience first. We ask, what is it like to experience the world? And once we've got some kind of answer to that, then we move on to questions like, what is the world like? And we can spot some interesting things in this way. Take this cup. If I were to consider it in the way that I normally do, I'd say that it's a cup and it has this pattern on it, it's, uh, it's got a chip out of it just here, and uh, I can drink tea out of it, there's tea stains in it. But if I pay attention to the way in which I experience it, I notice that I can never see all of it at once. Although I think of it as being a single, separate chunk of matter, I only ever see one side of it at a time. And I never see it just on its own. I always see it against some background or in some context, in some relation to me. So in fact, I'm not separate from the world at all. All my thoughts and the contents of my mind are inescapably bound up with it. For the phenomenologist, experience is not the inscription of impressions on the blank slate of the mind, but rather the intentional relation of consciousness to a world that is neither out there in a separate realm beyond consciousness, nor in here in the form of an innate idea. For the phenomenologist, consciousness is not a thing. Consciousness is always consciousness of something. Persons do not exist as such without a world to which they belong. In a previous video, we talked about split mind theory, the idea that to be a human being is to be split into two halves, the experienced self and the ideal self. The ideal self is like an internal other that monitors and critiques our behavior. And Gunther takes this idea up and says maybe other people and the stimulation they provide and the examples they set to us are key to forming that ideal self. With nobody else around, there's nobody to check whether what you just saw was real or only in your head. There's nobody to tell you, implicitly or explicitly, how you should behave. And so your ability to do that for yourself starts to break down. The mind starts to break down. If one is deprived for long enough of the experience of other concrete persons in a shared or common space, it is possible for one's own sense of personhood to diminish or even collapse, while the transcendental ego, or the pure capacity for experience, remains. Without the concrete experience of other embodied egos oriented towards common objects in a shared world, my own experience of the boundaries of those perceptual objects begins to waver. It becomes difficult to tell what is real and what is only my imagination playing tricks on me. I may begin to hallucinate, spontaneously generating an experience of imaginary others in the absence of concrete bodily relations, or I may have less dramatic, but no less unnerving, perceptual distortions, like the supermax prisoners for whom the wire mesh on their door begins to vibrate. 
or the surface of the wall seems to bulge. To the extent that we regard the prisoner as an individual who is separable from the world and others, even if we acknowledge that this individual is a social animal whose environment has some sort of effect on physical and mental health, we fail to grasp the depths of the harm inflicted by solitary confinement. The essential relatedness to others of the human mind is exposed perhaps most clearly by those prisoners who throw their own feces at the walls of their cells, so someone has to come in and clean it up. Ordinarily we might say, oh, they're just being disgusting or trying to be awful towards the guards, but Goethe invites us to the idea that people who do this can do it because they literally have nothing else left to do. In a six foot by nine foot cell, alone, for years, sometimes decades, there are no actions they can take that will meaningfully change their world. There are no tasks left to perform that can establish a relationship with somebody else. And if deprived of that relation with the world and others, the mind will break down. So almost as a self-defense mechanism, it forces a connection with somebody, even using the crudest of methods, even though that somebody will probably punish them more in the long term as a result. Part 3. Torture. Little wonder then that many people will consider solitary confinement to be a form of torture. Since the 20th century, torture techniques have come on a little bit. It's no longer in vogue to just put someone in thumbscrews or stretch them on the rack. It's also not a particularly reliable way of obtaining information, if the goal of the torture is to get information, which it isn't always. The CIA's Human Resources Exploitation Training Manual has this to say, the torture situation is an external conflict a contest between the subject and his tormentor. The pain which is being inflicted upon him from outside himself may actually intensify his will to resist. On the other hand, pain which he feels he is inflicting upon himself will be more likely to sap his resistance. And in line with that, Gunther says that torture in the modern age tends to focus on turning the victim against themselves, turning the experienced self against the ideal self. The use of stress positions, like forcing a prisoner to squat for hours on end, exploits their own body as the torture device, wearing them down psychologically as well as physically. It's a little bit like playing good cop, bad cop, only you make the prisoner their own bad cop. That way it's a lot easier for the torturer to come in and pretend to be the good cop who genuinely cares about the prisoner and just wants to get them out of this awful situation. Survivors of places like the Abu Ghraib prison and Guantanamo Bay have testified that loud music was played at them for hours by United States soldiers as an enhanced interrogation technique, and the principle there is the same. Gunther argues that solitary confinement is the purest distillation of this torture principle, turning the prisoner's capacity for any kind of experience, not just pain or sound, against them, turning the structure of their own minds against them. There are some practical implications of this discussion that are uncomfortable, but it would be disingenuous not to note them. The first is that if solitary confinement is a form of torture, legally or morally, then that would mean that the United States, which imprisons more people than any other country, both in terms of absolute numbers and relative to their population, and regularly uses solitary confinement, would be one of, if not the, biggest torturers in the world. Certain recent events might blunt the moral shock of a sentence like that. America! But in fairness to the current regime, this practice predates them by many years. Secondly, the inhabitants of prisons in the United States and in my country, the UK, are disproportionately people of colour, and therefore, so are the inhabitants of solitary confinement cells. In addition, you might think, as I did actually before I started researching this video, that solitary confinement is only for the worst of the worst. It's only for the really dangerous people, the really bad eggs. But that's also not true. Breaking prison rules can earn you time in solitary. And in prison there are a lot of rules that it's sometimes difficult to avoid breaking, especially the rules on fighting if you're caught in a bad spot and you need to defend yourself. In Pelican Bay Penitentiary in California, you can earn a trip to the <clears throat> special housing unit for tattooing, for having more than $5 without permission, and even for attempted suicide. Although it seems a lot like extra punishment, there are no extra trials or legal loopholes that you have to go through before solitary is added to your sentence. It's also worth asking the really, really hard question, 
even if solitary was in practice only for the worst of the worst, would it be okay to do even then? Given the nature and the type of the harm that it does, is that an okay thing to inflict on anyone? I originally had uh, quite a different ending for this video planned, uh, but I changed it more or less the last minute because I started to worry that it was coming across as a little bit preachy. So um, the the neo-Nazi terrorist Anders Breivik murdered 77 people, including several teenagers, in 2011. And uh, he's been in various forms of solitary confinement ever since. And uh, I have to confess, I, I have no sympathy for the man. Uh, I certainly would not want to be the guy who has to sit down and talk to Anders Breivik once a week just because he's going to lose his mind if, if we don't. I have sympathy and compassion for a lot of people in prison, but if you're coming at this from a place of, well, why should I care about these people, then at, at least in that one case, yeah, I, I completely agree. But at the same time, how we feel about people in prison isn't really the philosophical issue at stake here. The question that we're bumping up against is what is solitary confinement uh, and, and maybe prison more generally for? Like, like why, why are we doing this to people? And if the answer is supposed to be because of rehabilitation, it makes, makes bad people good, then we can't really ignore the fact that solitary and, and maybe to an extent prison generally is pretty incompatible with that goal. Like you, you, you can't rehabilitate somebody who's just been cancelled, who's just been destroyed in, in that way. We, we, we tell them to reflect on what they've done, but we, we just knacker them so that they can't reflect on it. We tell them to take responsibility for their actions, but we deprive them of any possible actions for which they might take responsibility. We tell them to make social and ethical transformations, but we deprive them of anybody relative to whom they might make that kind of a transformation. So we definitely don't help people in solitary confinement. We, we just make them easier to control and maybe give ourselves a little bit of schadenfreude. This is uh, really starting to get, get personal now, but um, sometimes when I'm really going through a rough patch in my life, I have this fantasy that I get on a plane over the ocean and uh, it crashes, but uh, I survive and I wash up on a beautiful desert island and everyone in my old life they just they think I'm dead. And I live there alone on the island for the rest of my days. Because there's no one there who, who can hurt me. And uh, there's no one there who I can hurt. But as I get older, I realize that that's not a healthy fantasy. That's a death wish. And uh, for better and worse, we really are all intertwined. The poet... John Donne once wrote, appropriately enough, no man is an island, entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if a promontory were, as well as if a manner of thy friends or of thine own were. Every man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind. And therefore, never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. Special thanks to Dan Olson, Mike Rugnetta, Anthony D'Angelo, and Gabrion from Keshengaya for lending their vocal talents to this episode. You can find links to all their works below. Oh.